Your brother Michael, certainly love and appreciate Brother Michael and Brother Brantley and the Lord's Church here at Bellevue. And I'm thankful for this privilege and opportunity to be here tonight and during the lectureship and that Daniel could be with me. I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the many faithful brethren, brothers and sisters in the Lord here at this time and during the lectureship and that we'll be here tomorrow. All the lessons, and I've heard them all, have been outstanding and very good, full of important information from the Word of God. And I appreciate all these things in Brother Wayne and his lesson a while ago and the other lessons today and those last night. So thankful for them. Now, Brother Bruce mentioned today something that I hadn't really heard or heard that much. He talked about the weak pew. Now, we've heard about weak pulpits. And I thought, you know, that's a good way to put it, the weak pew. When I was in the Philippines some years ago, on a Lord's Day evening, we were gathering outside to have worship. And it was in a country place, but here comes all these people. And they sat on benches. And on the back row, there was a row of young ladies. I got up, and all of a sudden, that bench flipped backwards, and they went with it. <laughs> of course, our pew or bench might flip backward, but that doesn't mean that we're a weak pew. <laughs> if we are strong in the Lord and the power of His might. You know, friends, we're talking about Christ and the church tonight. Some people are actually ashamed of the Church of Christ. And some of them are supposed to be members of the Church of Christ. Paul said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And if we're not ashamed of the gospel, we're not going to be ashamed of the Lord and His church either. Now there are some who say, well, give me Jesus, but not the church. Well, that's an insult to Christ. As we shall see, the church is his bride. We'll see that shortly. But you know, friends, tonight when we look at this lesson, we will see that one cannot magnify Christ without magnifying his blessed body, the church. And we will also see that Christ and his church are inseparable now my lesson tonight is a bit different than what's in the lectureship book because I noticed some other topics and some things that have already been addressed, which is very important. So I've changed it a bit to bring out some points to show and to hammer down this point. Christ and the church are inseparably connected. Here on Facebook about six to eight weeks ago, I had a comment about forsaking the assembling of the saints, based on Hebrews 10, 25. And there was one brother who wanted to challenge me on this. And he used a term that I heard several years ago, and I've never liked it, called churchianity. Churchianity. As if there is a contrast between the church and Christianity. But it's impossible to separate the two. That very expression denigrates the church of our Lord and the whole counsel of God. It's been said today, but you know the church is the habitation of God. Ephesians 2.22. And that within itself should show us the importance of the church of our Lord. It's the habitation of God. Now the church, first of all, is the bride of Christ. I remember Brother Marshall Keeble related this story several years ago about an elderly lady one night who wanted to be baptized. And she went and got her beautiful wedding gown. And some of the ladies were saying, Oh, you don't want to wear that in that muddy water? Oh, yes, I do. The first time I wore this, I married my husband. Tonight, I'm marrying a better man than he. She was becoming married to Jesus Christ as a member of his body of the church. In Romans 7 and verse number 4, Wherefore, my brethren, 
ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. When everyone obeys the gospel, he or she becomes joined to the Lord. In Galatians 3, 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let us also consider, my friends, the fact that this is one reason that a Christian should not be joined to a harlot or to another person in fornication because he or she is joined to the Lord. So let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and read what Paul says about this. And beginning at verse 15, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. My friends, tonight in Christ, in the church, if we're faithful, we are joined to the Lord. Isn't that a powerful thought? That we are joined to the Lord? Now, as we know, husband and wife are to be faithful to one another. I heard a lesson by the late Brother V. Howard on the internet, and he was talking about denominations and how that they would make a monster out of this. Can you imagine seeing a creature in the woods with one head and having hundreds or thousands of bodies? He said, you'd get out of there. That's what denominationalism would do to the church and to the Lord's way. With one head, but a multiplicity of bodies. And isn't that a very apt description? And Roman Catholicism would have a two-headed monster with Christ being one head and the Pope, the so-called vicar of Christ, being the other. But either one are completely out of harmony with what the New Testament teaches regarding the church. You know, friends, Christ is faithful. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 The rider of the white horse in Revelation 19.11 is called faithful and true, of course. That writer is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not a polygamist, nor is he an adulterer. He has one bride, and he is faithful to his bride, the church of our Lord. But also, beloved friends, we are to be faithful to him. We read of those in Revelation 14, verse 4. The scripture says, They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Have you seen members of the church, and I'm sure we have, who would only follow the Lord so far? They will not follow Him wherever He leads. When it means persecution or family rejection, they will stop there. Or as we have seen in recent years, if it means that a preacher or a school or a congregation has to give up friendships and fellowship ties that they've enjoyed through the years, they will not follow the Lord there in taking the stand for what is right. But let us be faithful to our Lord and Savior and follow Him wherever He leads. Over in John 15, 14, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. If you've been in the church for a while and you've suffered some things, and you've been persecuted, that word whatsoever means a lot, doesn't it? It means a lot. Whatsoever he commands us. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, Matthew 28, 20. We know that whatsoever says all that the Lord would command us. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. But now I'd like to go over to the book of 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. We remember in the Old Testament, it's repeated time and again, that the Lord thy God is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. 
God will not tolerate rivalry. And here in 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul speaks of the simplicity that is in Christ that actually means single-hearted devotion. Having no rivalry, no divided affections in addition to Christ. That's a description of faithfulness, the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul here loved the Lord so much and he loved the church and he loved souls to the point that he was jealous in behalf of God. Beginning at verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. In James 4th chapter verse number 4, those who are not singly devoted to Christ are called adulterers. And this, of course, would include physical adulterers, but the basic meaning there is spiritual adulterers. Those who are unfaithful to the Lord. James said, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So people who love the world and who are friendly with the world in the sense of being partaker of their evil deeds, these are in spiritual adultery. And they cannot be a friend to God. There are other ways that people may be unfaithful. By failing to do the thing that they know is right. James said, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James 4, 17. Those who forsake the assembly of the saints. Hebrews 10, verse 25. Those who no longer abide in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. 2 John, verse 9. Another scripture that describes faithfulness to the Lord on the part of the church is Matthew 6.33. Jesus said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In like manner, Jesus said in Mark 12, and beginning at verse 30, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second is likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Another mark of the church being loyal to Christ is wearing his name. We read in Romans 16, verse 16, The churches of Christ salute you. The very name Christian has embedded in it the name of Christ. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts 11, verse 26. We know that there is salvation in no other name. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Can you imagine a young man, he finds this young lady, and they get to know each other, they become fond of one another, and he asks her to marry him. And she says, oh yes, I'll marry you, I'll marry you, but that other boy over there, can I wear his name? I don't think that would go over very well. But there are people today that claim to belong to Christ. And yet, they won't wear his name. They won't stand up for the name of Jesus Christ. But now, secondly, the preaching of Christ is the preaching of the church. I'd like to go at this time to the book of Acts in the 8th chapter. This is when Philip went down to Samaria and preached Christ unto them. We read in Acts chapter 8, verse number 5. And then on down in the passage in verse number 12, we see some things that were involved in preaching Christ. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, there's the church, and the name of Jesus Christ, there's the name, 
They were baptized, both men and women, implying that preaching Christ is also to teach the plan of salvation. Several years ago, when I was preaching in Virginia, there was the Crossroads Movement. This is back in the late 70s and early 80s. It was called the Crossroads Movement back then, and later the Boston Movement and the Discipling Movement and the International Churches of Christ, or International Church of Christ. And uh, one of the members of the church said that this young lady was going to be baptized. She'd been taught by these Crossroads people. And someone who was not a Crossroads movement said something about the Church of Christ. She said, oh, I've never heard of the Church of Christ. You see, this foolishness they were teaching just to get converts, but not true converts to the Lord and not to the church. Now let's turn over to the book of Acts, the 20th chapter. Here Paul meeting at Miletus with the elders from Ephesus in Acts 20 and verse 25. He said to them, And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. What had Paul preached among them? The kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ in Acts the first chapter. And the first few verses. What did he do on earth between the resurrection and the ascension? He taught them concerning the kingdom of God. Then let's go over to the last chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28, where Paul meets with the Jews at Rome after he arrived there. In verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, they, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Moses, excuse me, concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. We see here then teaching them concerning Jesus, what did he preach? The kingdom of God. And then the last two verses of the book of Acts. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And thus to hold fast the pattern or form of sound words, we must preach the kingdom of God the church. Because Christ and the church are inseparably connected. We know moreover that when we preach the kingdom, we preach Jesus because he is the king over the church. He is the head of the church and the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5, 23. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords and blessed only potentate, 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 15. But now thirdly, my friends, let us consider that the church is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This time we're going to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 1. And then we're going to Two other verses to the Thessalonians. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Then we go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the Lord's church is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. That should tell us that the church and the Godhead are inseparably connected. One who is in Christ is in the church. I heard this illustrated like this one time. You have a bucket of water. And you fill it up to the brim. If you stick your hand in the bucket 
it's also in the water. Well, if you're in Christ, you're also in the church. But the denominational concept is that you have the bucket of water, but it's not full. So you can have your hand in the bucket, but not have it in the water. Now, that's a pretty simple illustration, but it gets the point over. When everyone becomes a part of Christ, he is saved. As Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. And when one is saved, the Lord adds him to the church, Acts 2, 47. When one is baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. One is baptized into the Lord's body, the church. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse number 13. Now, my friends, in the fourth place, let's consider the connection between Christ and the body. In Ephesians 5, verse 23 and 24, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And then Colossians 1.18, And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. That is, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The preeminence means the first place of honor and supremacy. The one who is to have that is not a preacher or not the members, no leaders in the church, no well-known brotherhood brethren, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Beloved, this is one of our problems in the brotherhood. People are more concerned about having a big name than the greatest name of all, Jesus Christ. And they will sacrifice Christ Keep that big name. And we've seen brethren do that through the years. But now, the church is the fullness of Christ. Staying in the book of Ephesians in the first chapter, the last two verses. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Paul is very plain here, saying that the body is the church. But in chapter 4, verse 4, there's only one body. I wondered for a while about Ephesians 1, 3. I understood that all spiritual blessings are in Christ, but the heavenly places. I studied about that, and I read, and based on things that came out of the study, the heavenly places refers to the church. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now think about the Christian, one who's become a member of the body of Christ, the church. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, And hath raised us up together and made us, that is us in the church, sit together in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. That refers to people in the church. But now back to the fullness of Christ here in Ephesians 1, 23. The church, the body being the fullness of Christ. That means that there is nothing in Christ, no blessing, no privilege that can be found that is not in the church of our Lord. The church, the body of Christ, is the fullness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No person who has been saved from sin is outside of the body of Christ, the church. We can prove that by Ephesians 5.23. That Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. The Bible doesn't promise that God will save anyone else except those in the body, the church. And again, Acts 2, 47, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Regarding the close connection between Christ and the church and the members, again, I want to go to the book of Colossians chapter 2 
And this time, verse number 19. And not holding the head, that's with a capital H, and I'm glad it is. It's talking about Christ. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. When I graduated from Fried Hardman back in the years of A long ago, back in 79. Uh, I had a friend there on campus. He was on the tumbling team. And I moved to Virginia after I graduated to preach full time. And I received word that this friend had had an accident one afternoon. They were practicing tumbling and he landed on his head and he became paralyzed. And I went to see this young man when I came back to Tennessee some months later. He was in the wheelchair and of course I noticed atrophy with his arms and all that. But the point is when the nerve, the message center, the brain is disconnected from the body, then that paralyzes the body. Now take that illustration and apply it to the church. And we see why so many today, members and congregations, have become spiritually paralyzed. And why they are weakening away. They no longer have that communication with the head of Jesus Christ. And the reason is not because of Christ. It's because they have willed it to be so. They no longer want to heed and to hear what the Lord says through His Word. And Jesus said, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? This is why they no longer have the spiritual life and vitality. In John 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In Matthew 4, verse 4, He answered Satan, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hebrews 4.12, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing son of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is God's word, my beloved friends, that will build us up and take us to heaven, as Paul said to the Ephesian elders, and I, brethren, I commend you to God, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul uses a beautiful illustration regarding the members and their connection one with another, and then in their connection with Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to read the entire passage, but for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse number 26, And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, you know, if you're running around the house barefooted, and, uh, you know, maybe being a little bit careless, and you get a big wooden splinter in your heel, you know, your mind begins to concentrate on that heel. And you will take and you will bend over and take your hand and start trying to repair the damage or whatever, pull out the, the splinter. But your whole body is involved in that, just a little splinter. That's a good illustration for the Lord's church, isn't it? That we should be so connected one with another that if one has cause for rejoicing, we can all rejoice, but if one suffers... I'll rejoice with it. Now, Paul in this passage talks about the many members of the body of Christ. And in verse 27, he said, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. But number five this evening, the value of the church. The value of the church. It is blasphemous to denigrate the church because it is to speak lightly of Christ and His sacrifice, and His blood. That's blasphemous. When people demean the church, they are blaspheming the Lord because He shed His blood for the church. 
He loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In Acts 20, verse 28, Paul said to the Ephesian elders again, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And that one verse, there's many lessons in it, not only about elders, but about the church, but also about the deity of Christ. Christ is called God here, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. As the church, we are to glorify God. For you are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. The purchase price of the church is the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, verse number 19. Now friends, let's travel over to the book of Revelation in the first chapter. We know that in Ephesians 5, 25 and Acts 20, 28, these scriptures speak of the Lord's church everywhere for all time from the beginning of its founding in Acts 2 until the end. And of course, it was in the eternal plan and purpose of God, as Brother Brewer expressed so well last night from Ephesians chapter 3. But also, the local congregation is valuable to the Lord. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1. Here, John addresses the seven churches of Asia in verse 4. And in verse 11 to 13, and I want to read the last part of verse 12 and Verse 13, he said, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So for one thing, we see that Christ is in and amongst and amidst his people, the church, and in the local congregations. To every one of these seven churches, he said, I know thy works. The Lord is with His faithful people. We need to remember the value of the local church also because they are represented as seven golden candlesticks. And verse 20 indicates that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Gold is the most precious metal known to man. The church is very precious, but also the local church is very precious. Golden candlesticks. What is the purpose of a candlestick or a lampstand? It is to uphold the light. That's what the Lord is depending on the local church to do. To shine forth the light of Jesus Christ. And hence, as has been pointed out today so well, the church is the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Beloved, if we do not defend the truth, no one else is going to. Paul said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. But we also have to spread the truth and teach our fellow man who is lost in sin the precious gospel of Christ. Brother Kagega in his good presentation today mentioned the fact that he got started on the path to the truth by one little track. One little track. You know, any member of the church can hand someone a good track. Maybe we think, oh, well, you know, that's just a little thing. It won't do any good, but let's not be the judge. The seed is the Word of God, Luke 8, verse 11. It's our duty to plant the seed as the church, and then let the seed do its work. Many people will not accept the truth and will not obey it. But what if we reach one precious soul like Brother Bernard who's taught many souls and converted them since his conversion to Christ and has helped start congregations and train other gospel preachers. We do not know where that seed is going to lead because the seed is the Word of God and it is powerful. Before we close here in just a moment, it is in the church of our Lord that God is glorified. It's in the church. It's not in civic organizations. It's not in clubs. It's not in many other meanderings that men get off on 
and don't spend time for the church, it's in the Lord's church. Ephesians 3, 21, Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. When we are faithful members of the church, beloved friends, we are carrying on the work of the Lord. Christ said in His prayer of John 17, I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. When we work in the church, that's what we do. The Lord is depending on us. He is depending on us to do His work, to follow the pattern, to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus by His authority, Colossians 3.17, to worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4.24, and to do the three areas of work, benevolence, edification, and evangelism is laid out in God's work. He is depending on us to be like our Savior. In 2 John 2, John said, The truth that dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. It's talking about God's Word. It is eternal in nature, is it not? 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. John said, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Let me just uh, put this thought before you and based on the Scripture. What will answer church growth? And I know today we have a lot of non-receptive people out there. You can't throw good seed on that asphalt out there and expect something to come up. But what we need to be sure is that people have the love of the Lord, His Word, His truth, the church in them that His Word, the Word of Christ, is dwelling in them and in us richly, Colossians 3.16. An honest heart cannot hold it in. An honest heart. When one has the truth in his heart, if he is an honest person, he can't hold it in. He will have to tell others about Christ. He will have to go to others with the truth. You won't have to make him come down to the church building to worship God. An honest heart cannot hold it in. Like one of the older brethren used to say to his preacher students, boys, don't preach if you can help it. You know what he meant. Jeremiah couldn't help it. He had to preach. He said, the word was like a fire in my bones. And I could not stay. I could not hold it in. As we close this evening, Ephesians 22, 17, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. The Spirit says, Come to Christ through the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, 17. But the Bride is the church. And we have to take the Spirit's message and invite others to come to Christ. That's our job. To invite them to come. This evening, my friend, will you come? Having heard the Word of God, will you believe? Romans 10, 17. Will you repent or will you perish? Luke 13, verse 3 and 5. Will you confess Jesus Christ, the Son of God, before men? Acts 8, 37, Matthew 10, 32. And then do not tarry, do not delay, but arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Or if you need to come back to Christ, you realize that you have not treated the church properly as the bride and body of the Son of God. And you need to come back this evening while we stand and we sing.